started with today's talk. So I want to thank Harsha for joining us. Um, he's many hours ahead of us in India. So it's his evening. So I thank you very much for taking time out of your evening to join us. Um, I came across his article, I guess, several weeks ago and was very interested in this idea of how much can computing can we actually do on microprocessors going forward? And how will that change kind of the world of IoT devices and what they can do for us? Um, and so I thought this article was really informative, kind of where is the current state of the art in this? What's the future? What are the limitations that we have? Um, so with that, I'll go ahead, and if you want to start out introducing yourself, Harsha, a little bit more about your background, um, and then take it from there. Okay. So, hello, everyone. It's going to be a good afternoon for you all, I guess. Uh, uh, I'm Harsha al Churi, and I'm currently working as a research scholar and a professor TV Prabhakar at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Um, I'm delighted to be here and give you a brief overview of TinyML and its numeral applications. In the end, I'll also be sharing about my ongoing research in this field where we were trying to leverage uh, TinyML and see how it can help us in industries. So we were using TinyML for pre predictive maintenance tasks. So uh, can I sh uh, share my slides and start the presentation? You should have sharing. You just had yeah. them up, but I don't see them up right now. Just a second. Uh, can you see them now? Yep, I can see them. Yeah. So this is going to be the agenda for today's presentation. First, I'll start with a small demo of what TinyML can do. Then we'll run over through some basic dimensions, which we need to uh, understand to understand the concept of TinyML. Then we will see uh, what machine learning is and IoT is, and how these two can be merged to give the concept of TinyML. And then we will uh, see the requirements like hardware and software needed to run your own TinyML application. And then we will see the workflow of TinyML. And then see we will see the various applications where TinyML can be used and uh, case studies where. A tiny ML is actually being used. And then I'm going to explain you about uh, Prema, which is my current research, a predictive maintenance of solenoid wall in real time at embedded edge level. Then I'm going to show you a demo of my research. So mm, I'll start uh, with the demo, I guess. Just a second. I'll sit down. Uh, so, uh, I guess you all can see this. This is basically a magic wand. Uh, what actually is, is in the top. If you want to share your slides, it'll be bigger. Uh, uh, can you come again? Yeah, you're in the real small window when your slides are presenting. Okay, uh, I'll stop this. Yeah. Yep, that's better. Change the screen to the presenter. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. okay, you're big now. Okay, mm. so this is actually a um, magic wand. It has a microcontroller at the top, which is attached to a pen. So what it can actually do is, if I write some gestures in the air, it can convert into it uh, the gestures into numbers. Uh, let me show you that. Um, can you see the uh, white screen? So this is a Arduino terminal. Okay. Oh, just a
so so if i write some number like 1 uh, you can see that uh, it has identified that it is one here with a probability also uh, okay uh, this, this section of the screen so if i write something like 2 it can identify the numbers it's not highly accurate because uh, the model which is used being run here has some constraints because it is being deployed in a uh, microcontroller this will be the code uh, no oh, this is just a simple example of what uh, time we can achieve with tiny ml oh, i'll continue with the slides so those predictions are being made on the device itself yeah on the controller uh, okay so there is some uh, a small deep neural network which is being deployed uh, in this microcontroller and then it keeps on inferencing uh, the real time data which it is getting from the accelerometer so it keeps in, it keeps on inferencing and whenever it finds the gesture for which it is trained uh, it will output it to the screen so that is all about the uh, demo now i'm going to run through some uh, definitions which we need which are necessary for understanding the concept of tiny ml so uh, uh, first definition is microprocessor so a microprocessor is basically a cpu fabricated on a single chip so inside the microprocessor there are some registers which are general purpose and some are special purpose uh, which uh, which are used for temporary storage of data and there is also an alu and uh, which is where the whole uh, automatic operations and logical operations are being done and there is some mechanism some bus mechanism to interface with input output devices and memory since a microprocessor doesn't have a memory and input input with it we need some external mechanism to interface with them so this is what essentially a microprocessor is then if we go to micro what a microcomputer is microcomputer is a computer which is built around microprocessor since a microprocessor contains only registers and alu and control it does not contain any memory or any facility for input output to make a computer system we have to interface all these devices with the microprocessor then if we go to a microcontroller which is essentially what we need in a tiny ml it is a microcomputer fabricated on a single chip so if the whole microcomputer can be shrunk and put in a single chip we get a microcomputer microcontroller since we are putting everything on a single chip the total chip area has to be shared by the processor memory etc then if you see what an embedded system is these are computing systems that are hidden inside an environment by the term environment we mean the surrounding or actually the scenario for which the system was designed Uh, if you take an example of an air conditioning unit the air conditioning machine the ac machine is supposed to be housed inside a room normally so if you consider the computing system that is sitting inside the ac machine for that system the ac machine is going to be the environment it does not interact with anybody outside the ac machine it is responsible for controlling the ac machine and the commands which are given to the ac machine and its whole job was to make sure that the ac mission is being run properly so that is what a session essentially embedded system is. it is a micro controller based system that is specifically designed to control a function or a range of functions now if we uh, let's go to machine learning uh, there isn't a well accepted definition of what is and what is in machine learning but we'll go through a couple of examples which some people have uh, tried to define it the first definition is given by arthur samuel so he defined machine learning as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being ex explicitly programmed so 
in his work other samuel tried to develop a checkers pro- program the important thing to notice he himself is not a good checkers player but he wrote a program which can play against itself tens and thousands of times so as humans we don't have uh, the patience of playing it those many times but the computer programs are not like that so upon playing uh, with itself like a numerous number of times it started figuring out uh, which board positions are good and which are bad and which board position might lead to wins and which more positions might lead to losses and at some point in time it even bet uh, defeated other samuel in the checkers game so this is how machine learning works so if we see another example of what machine learning uh, another definition of what machine learning is given by tom mitchell he says it is a computer program and it is said to learn from experience e with respect to some task t and some performance measure p if its performance on t as measured by p improves with experience e so if we compare it with uh, the checkers program here the experience e is itself being is the checkers program playing uh, the game again and again with itself and if we see what the task t is the task t is to play the checkers program and if we want uh, if you want to know what the p is so if given new order uh, what is the probability uh, if you given a new opponent what is the probability with which it is going to defeat that new upon it so this is what machine learning essentially is and then we'll see what iot is so uh, kevin ashington's uh, definition of iot is using internet to empower computers to sense the world for themselves so the key thing to note here is there are no humans in, involved in this loop so generally humans are the one triggering things but according to his definition not anymore for example if we consider an uh, uh for example if we consider a use case where uh if it is sunny outside and you want your window shades to come down one option is to get up from your seat and press a button the window shades come down another option is to put a sensor which is looking outside and uh, sensing the light intensity and communicating this information to a another sensor which is attached to the shades so when it feels like the light intensity is high enough the shades comes down this is how essentially iot is now if we see a more formal definition of iot it is a global infrastructure for the information society enabling advanced services by interconnecting physical and virtual things based on existing and evolving interoperable information and communication technologies so what we discussed about computers brains and so on and so forth are all about computers which are connected to these systems so one key thing to note it is it mentioned that it is interconnecting physical or virtual things so the one example of virtual thing is like if you are coming to your laptop and you open your screen and then you get the computer already shows you some screen uh, a page where you left off earlier so where is the page the page that actually doesn't exist it is a virtual page so iot is not just about physical things it is about virtual things also so how iot and ml can be merged if we think of the same blinds example the user may want different light intensities during different times of his day based on the work he does now can you make a system which works more intelligently pertaining to the needs of the user we can use some ml ml algorithm to learn what the user wants but if the algorithm is running somewhere in the cloud we need to transfer the data to the cloud and then uh, inference it there and then send back the results so there is a real time delay here and moreover uh, not everyone wants to send their personal details to the cloud so there are privacy issues with that so what if we can make intelligent decisions in real time while keeping the data local to the system that is what all tiny ml is tiny ml is running uh, machine learning algorithms on embedded devices at the average of less than 1 millivolt in power this power requirement is important because it allows unintended unattended devices or 
on batteries on energy harvesting. Suppose, let's say, if we have a machine learning algorithm on an embedded device, which uh, consumes so much high power, then it is uh, not that useful because so the user needs to change the batch batteries regularly or he needs to charge it again and again. So there is human intervention here. So the power requirement is very important. It should be in such a way that if uh, the whole system is deployed on some coin cell battery or somewhere, uh, it should be able to run for hours or weeks, etc. So that is what ideally tiny ML is. However, we'll stretch the definition temporarily to include microcontroller units that use of tens of milliwatts because they're easy to work and they're widely available. And if we look at the hardware and software which we need uh, to run a typical tiny ML application, then we need a laptop where we code the application and then some embedded device which can support tiny ml uh, for instance like arduino nano 33 really sense which i used for demonstrating the uh, magic wand or some spark fun edge esp32 raspberry pi pico these are some of many microcontrollers which support tiny ml harsha we have a question real quick so yeah and we, like what is the tiny machine learning is it a software that we're gonna install a raspberry Pi, or is it like a different hardware or tiny ml is a concept it is the concept of deploying machine learning algorithms on microcontrollers so we need both hardware and software the software being the actual algorithm and the hardware being uh, the place or the platform where this algorithm can run so like the hardware could be the raspberry Pi, right yeah, Raspberry by Pico. Okay. Um, and so just to clarify, the demo you gave at the beginning was running on an Arduino Nano. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Then if you look at the software which we require. Uh, oh, hold uh, on for a second. We have another question. But this is not currently a library that we have in Python that we can yeah. uh, leverage. Yeah. Uh, it is something that needs to be <clears throat> coded, you know, directly on the embedded device. Is that a fair statement, or is that? Yeah, uh, it's kind of correct. Uh, ideally, you should be the one who uh, need to code the actual machine learning algorithm into TinyML, but we have uh, some library support where if you write some machine learning algorithm in Python uh, using some library, there are libraries which convert this uh, algorithm into a form which can be ported directly into microcontrollers. So this is under development uh, in a way. The, the yeah. Library. Thank you. Um, like, I'm just wondering if you can like give us like a next time a demo on like how to code and like oh. machine learning, but like, like I want to know like how how we do it. Like, okay, um, we can talk to him at the end if he can okay. come back. I mean, this is I think more of the overview, which okay. is where his paper is. But okay. if we want to have him back to kind of walk us through how okay. does he actually do it, okay, we could do that as well if he's available for it. Um, okay. He's in India, so it's oh, okay. late at night for him. So, yeah. okay, you can continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. If we look at the software which we need, uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro is one, li one library way which can help us for deploying uh, traditional ML or DL algorithms into microcontrollers by converting them into the form which is accepted by microcontrollers and also by optimizing it so that it, re uh, it meets the size constraints of the microcontrollers. And we need uh, some editor where you can code with code the microcontroller. So if you look at the basic workflow of TinyML, uh, first of all, we need some sensors which are collecting the uh, real life data. And obviously if this data is collected, being collected in real life, it is in the form of, uh, it, it is noisy. So we need to pre-process it. So once we pre-process it, we need to figure out uh, what are all the use cases which we not we want to find out with the help of our algorithm? So we prepare our data set, uh, data set uh, generalizing all these use cases, and then we use some traditional ML or DL algorithms and we train the model. But we need to make sure that the model is not so big so that even after 
optimizing it, it should still meet the constraints of the uh, microcontroller. So then we use uh, some libraries like TensorFlow, like Micro, which I uh, described in the earlier slide, to convert into to some .h or some format which is accepted by the microcontroller, and then it is being deployed to the microcontroller. So once it is uh, being deployed in real life, we get uh, live data from the sensors. And then with the help of the model, which is already there in the microcontroller, we can do on-device inference and have a real-time predictions of what is actually required. So this is essentially uh, the workflow of TinyML. Now, if we look at the applications of TinyML, uh, it is almost present in this. It can all be, almost be deployed in every domain, like health, environment, agriculture, industries. Uh, we will see a case study of how TinyML is being used in each of these sectors. So if you see the health sector, there is some project known as uh, Solar Scase Mosquito Project, which deploys small, smart Internet of Things robotic platforms to help curb the spread of micro uh, mosquito-borne epidemics such as malaria, dengue, and Zika virus. So the system actually works by disrupting the mosquito breeding cycles by agitating water likely to contain mosquito larva. The system uses rain and then acoustic sensors to determine when it needs to agitate water to conserve battery and enable it to run on solar power indefinitely. It also sends smart summary statistics and alerts to warn of possible mosquito mass breeding events over low power, low speed communication protocols. By making the system self-sufficient, small and affordable, these devices can be deployed widely and preventing mosquitoes spread. Now, if you look at how it can be used in environment, there is a project known as Elephant Edge. So in this project, they want to achieve the following objectives with the help of TinyML. So these objectives are like risk monitoring, conflict monitoring, activity monitoring, community communication monitoring. So for example, uh, when an elephant is moving into a high risk area, then they can send out notifications to the park rangers in real time. So the idea is to develop a collar which will be around the elephant. And then it has some sensors which will be used according to the use case. If their um, idea was to prevent conflict, then they keep some GPS sensors. And then so they'll continuously monitor when the elephant is going to high, uh, like areas where farmers live or something. They can uh, coordinate, then the humans come, come and then investigate, or they can redirect these elephants to some other place so that the conflicts between the farmers and elephants doesn't happen. And if you look at some activity monitoring, then them uh, which can be used to classify the general behavior of elephants, such as drinking, eating, sleeping, etc., for better understanding of animals. And moreover, we can even have a microphone on board so that if there are any poachers nearby, then the microphone, the tiny ML algorithm running on the microcontroller can detect that uh, it is in a high risk zone, and then park rangers can come and uh, solve the issues. So if we take a case study of agriculture, here, uh, we, if you all can see the red uh, box-like thing, which is on the pole, that is actually an embedded system. So since greenhouse SS are an important part of producing food to feed the surrounding community, it is important to keep an eye on, out for plant, plant diseases and pests that can ruin the crop. Machine learning approaches have gone a long way towards avoiding such problems. But without Wi-Fi, most dividers either will not work or cannot report the problems that they find. To support greenhouses in remote or otherwise unconnected areas, a new approach is needed. A low power microcontroller is used to create a device that can monitor for these problems. And then they, it can also report the results for extended period of time without either using Wi-Fi connectivity or a mains power availability. Idea was to use a computer vision based application to capture images of plants in greenhouses and classify them to identify any areas of concern. And then LTE extension boards were added into the embedded system device so that instead of using Wi-Fi, if there is some anomaly which is detected by this device, it can simply use cellular networks to report this issue. Uh, the device works in a way like it 
wakes up every three hours then it does a inference and then inspection of all the plants and then if it finds any problems it reports otherwise it goes back to sleep thus saving the power in case of industries tiny ml can be used for predictive maintenance in industrial automation initial process automation sensors like pressure temp uh, temperature etc and controllers and actuators solenoid walls electromagnetic mechanical relays, circuit breakers, circuit breakers, monitors, etc. Make sure that their production lines are working under the predefined conditions. When these systems malfunction or something sometimes completely fail, alerts have to be generated in real time to make sure not only that the production quality is not compromised, but also the safety of humans and equipment is assured. We will see a full-fledged case study of application of tiny ML in industries in further slides. So my research also lies in how to deploy tiny ml for industries so the name of my research is prema predictive maintenance of solar and wall in real time at embedded level so let's say uh, a solar and wall has a broad spectrum of applications in industries automations automobiles agriculture medicine in almost every field for example in industrial sectors it is being used in nuclear power plants it is being used in uh, automobile sectors and in, plethora, and in plethora of original equipment manufacturing applications. Whereas in agricultural field, it is deployed for automation of irrigation systems. In the automobile sector, it is used in coolant regulators and for automotion of, automation of water fuel separation systems. The medical industries employ SPs in dialysis systems, drug flow regulation, regulators, clinical processing plants, and ventilators. So, over times, what happens is the efficiency of these walls might deteriorate, thus the compromising the entire process for which it is employed. This type of compromises due to quality issues over time can lead to a disastrous phenomenon while being engaged in crucial processes. For instance, the SV used in medical grade ventilator is responsible for several of the ventilator's critical functions, such as activating the mixing cylinder, air, oxygen, etc. Many scenarios can be speculated if one of these SVs deployed in the ventilator malfunctions, which can lead to breathlessness and also prove fatal. This situation can be circumvented by real-time predictive maintenance of such crucial components. One such economical and acu accurate predictive maintenance is estimation of RUL and RUL, which is the remaining useful life, and also fault detection of the solar network. So, here I have some uh, transient responses of the graphs which I obtain when solenoid wall is being actuated. Uh, sorry, our measurement campaign for uh, fault detection involves computation of transient responses of solenoid wall under four different conditions. Then transient response of all the states is captured during the actuation phase of the wall. So the current profile thus extracted encompasses all the characteristics of solenoid wall and which it ex exhibits during its transition from ideal to ex excitation state. Hence, capturing solenoid uh, transient response for different types of walls lays a firm foundation for analyzing the solenoid wall. It is evident from the graph that considering the transient response for uh, feature extraction to facilitate the failure analysis is considered as a well-rounded choice as it shows a clear distinction between the various wall states for example if you look at this graph uh, this is the graph which you obtain when the solenoid wall is excited for when it is in good state so if we take a faulty wall like a spool stack wall we can see that there is no dip here so this can from this we can say that it is a faulty wall and if we see a spring failure wall we can see that the dip is very low and it is not exactly how it uh, should be like the good wall so from looking, we can say that these walls are, we can classify that these walls belong to different false states, but how are we going to automate this? So we need some machine learning algorithm to identify the different wall states. So we started extracting some features from these walls so that we use these features to determine which state of the wall it is. We took these following features like uh, 
the graph here is ECV, which is electric current pole versus time. So here ECV lower average is the average of the graph in this period, which is zero minus 0 0.05 to zero. And then if we take ECV upper average, it is the average of the electric current value in this period, which is 0 0.02 seconds to 0 0.05 seconds. And then delta ECV is the difference of this Two parameters and then we have 10 percent ecv is 10 percent of delta ecv plus lower average and similarly the 90 percent ecv and then tl is the time at which the electric current value hits 10 percent of ecv and tu is the time at which uh, the electric current value hits 90 percent of ecv and dr by dt is the slope it is 90 percent ecv minus 10 percent ecv by tu minus tl and then AUC is the area end of the curve in this period, which is 0 to 0 0.2 seconds. So we can see from uh, this graph that NSV's current signature conveys some crucial information about its present state of health. It has been proven that current transient response during this phase exhibits a distinct, distinct profile with distinct faults. The raw data we fetch is in the form of ECV of SV with respect to time during the activation phase of SV. And now this figures projects the performance of our model on production data of, of unseen solenoid walls in the form of heat map. Uh, for the test, four different solenoid walls with four different conditions were analyzed using Prema. Prema is the product which we built and each wall was operated for a period of 500 cycles and the predicted probabilities were recorded for every fifth cycle of operation. Finally, the average of the predicted probabilities were taken to test the model's consistency. So here we can see that if we give a new wall of good wall, the model is able to predict with 99.4% accuracy that it is a good wall. So we have actually a good accuracy unless in spring failure case, which is a 73%. Now coming back to the RUL analysis, which is the remaining useful life analysis. Uh, this is actually the key component because this is what tells uh, how much amount of life is remaining for this particular wall. So what we did is we took a, a new wall and then we started running it again and again and again. So, and in the middle, we started accelerating. Uh, we started using accelerating tests. Like we started giving eight bar pressure and then we started using temperature. So then we can, we saw that there was a failure of the wall. And here from these two graphs, we can see that area under the curve has a dip when we, uh, the failure of the wall starts. And when the wall has reached its end of the life, the other parameter, the DIABTT, the slope has increased uh, abruptly. So with the help of these two parameters, we can see that the whole life of SV can be explained using these two parameters. And on the right, you can see that initially the wall has started with a nice deep like graph and as the number of cycles increase it started uh, behaving like a spool stuck wall and at then it it showed a complete graph where which resembled exactly the spool stuck wall so at then we we physically confirmed that it also has a spool stuck because of the accelerated test so these are the real results the first graph is that uh, loss curve which we obtained during the training process and the second graph is the one which we obtained when we take a new wall and then we did the same audio process. And this time with the help of the model, we actually tried to predict what actually this remaining useful life might be at that point. So the orange curve is the point which is predicted the model. So we can see that it is not that far behind, behind the actual uh, RUL. And then this is the whole system flow. So it shows the end to end life cycle of prema so the deployment process can be broadly classified into two stages product design and packaging and system flow product design is the primary step of uh, product development like uh, it involves product packaging and then it also involves printing the specific circuit design and 3d enclosure design then the application specific circuit design integrates the embedded system hardware and alert and alerting system consists of the OLED design and versa. The integration was then converted into a printed circuit board consisting of all the aforementioned components. Uh, 
which was then enclosed in a 3D printed enclosure. Then the system involves the whole process starting from sensing to inferencing and in initial deployment, the design product and okay, in initial deployment, the whole Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, this middle box is what actually we uh, designed. Uh, the name of the product is Prema. So Prema is connected in series to a solenoid wall, and between a PLC and a SV, without actually interrupting its uh, production use case. So in real time, in digital deployment, when a fault is detected or the predicted audio drops below the threshold. An alarm is issued by triggering the buzzer and the product utilizes the OLED screen to display the fault probabilities and audio continuously in real time. Moreover, if the, the product senses that the solenoid wall is about to get uh, destroyed or is about to reach its end of the life, it can actually physically uh, send some notifications to the factory managers uh, manager telling that so and so wall is about to get replaced, uh, is able to reach its end of life. So it's better that you replace it before itself so that you don't have the production line waiting for this. So here I took some demos of um, the project. So I think it's uh, pretty fast. Let me slow, slow this down. So just to clarify for me, Harsha, so the, yeah. the machine learning component is all being done on the Arduino there that you had in the prior slide. Yes. How much power is an Arduino using compared to the ideal which you had given us for the definition of tiny ML? I, I know this is early research, so it's yeah. not yet, but like how many, is an Arduino oh. using 10 times as much power as the goal, 100 times as much power? Uh, ideally, uh, the goal of TinyML is to bring down the uh, power to less than milliwatts, but I I don't have an idea of exact figures, but I know for sure that Arduino consumes more than 10 milliwatts. Okay. Although it's not uh, far fetched from the ideal goal. Yeah. Okay, I'm just curious. Okay. Uh, 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 I think, uh, uh, let me see, uh, it's not um, related question. Uh, we have another question, Arshan. Okay, okay. So, and this is just from a preventive maintenance point of view, uh, to replace the valve compared to replacing a failed valve, how much time do you really have to shut down the production line? Did, did you think about that? Is there a benefit to, prevent, to, to replacing the valve early? as opposed uh, to replacing it when it fails. I mean, typically you need to have a cost that the cost of failure needs to be significant, significantly higher than the cost of preventive maintenance for the preventive maintenance to be worthwhile. Is that uh, something you're considering? Yeah, uh, like I, I understood your question, but if we see the applications of solenoid wall, it, it is also used in some critical applications like nuclear power plants and then in some ventilators of the hospitals. And there has been incidents in the past that uh, many people had lost their lives because of the failure of the single wall. So in applications which are very critical, then predicting it before is far useful. Yeah, that means that the cost of failure is a lot higher than the cost of preventive maintenance. Yes. And, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so that, that you need to have that context, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this is the demo of the uh, actual implementation of this product. So here, this is the solenoid wall. And then this is the power supply. And when the wall gets activated, you can see an improvement uh, increase in the current. And then this is the product, which has the LED screen. 
Uh, can you guys see what is printed on the screen? No, it's uh, a little too small, but that's fine. Uh, okay, so it shows the four categories of wall. It might be like the accuracy, whether it can be a good wall or it can be a spool stuck or it can be a spring failure or it can be an under voltage. And then below it also shows the remaining useful life. Uh, like how much percentage of life is still remaining. Okay, uh, I don't think it's visible. So this is another demo where this is the same demo, but repeated with a faulty wall, but I, I don't think you can see the values. So it is same as good as the first uh, demo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we only have about 10 more minutes. So if you want to keep going, we can um, we can get the videos from you too and put them on the website. People want to okay. see them. Uh, uh, so this is here we see this is all about the demo of the project. So and these are the references which I use in the presentation. So, so if you have any further questions, I can answer them. Yeah, so I guess one question I have um, is in terms of so the amount of power that you're trying to be able to get down to for IoT devices is one issue. What is the memory, like in general terms, like how much more memory does an IoT device have to have than what we currently can do in order for machine learning to take place on it? Are we close? Mm -hmm. Uh, generally, if we see in terms of memory constraint, uh, the Arduino Nano 33 BLE sense, which I used, it has a memory of 25 KB, which is actually quite less when if you want to deploy some powerful algorithms. Uh, so for simple use cases, uh, for now this might work, but if you want to do more intelligent works, then memory constraint is going to be a problem. Um, so that uh, does that answer your question yeah i guess a follow up then like for the algorithm that you wrote how much memory is it taking uh, it, it's around 20 kb i guess okay uh, and but, it's in uh, c++ plus or what is it in what language uh, like uh, the actual uh, machine learning uh, like deep learning algorithm is written in python then i use the TensorFlow Lite micro library to convert it into the C++ code, which is being supported by R, that uh, Arduino Nano. Yeah, and I, so I did a training last year on a company that makes microprocessors called Parallax, but they have it, like their native is you code in Python, and then it converts everything to C++ to run on it because it's so much smaller. Um, so yeah. there are microprocessing companies that kind of smooth that path for you. Whereas Arduino is pretty much straight. Like if you go to Arduino, we have them at home. My kids play with them, but you have to do everything in C++. They don't have a way to really, unless you get more complicated, but their general, what you get out of the box type stuff is. I'm just wondering like, had, like, do you think it's applicable if we have like two Arduinos having like working with two machines? It's called Spellbar, right? Pardon? Uh, oh. Valve or the Bohr machine? Like, oh, the valves. Yeah. Yeah, this. Okay, uh, have you tried like using two with like multiple Arduinos, then it predicts? Or... Have you tried running predictions in order to get like multiple Arduinos with multiple uh, Arduinos connected to the same valve? Uh, actually, one uh, Arduino is enough to take care of one wall. So, if you want to monitor multiple walls, we need multiple Arduinos. Yeah. Hmm. Like, does your question relate to the fact because, that the multiple Arduinos would actually like, make I the same see, optimization? Like, because IoT is not one device, like we're gonna have multiple devices, right? Yeah, but are you talking about multiple devices for the same thing to see yeah. if is to yeah. see if the signals from the different 
like and having different machines and just like aggregates like like uh, aggregate like there is like the data from multiple Arduinos and predict something. Well, so if you have a lot, I mean, if you have a larger machine, right, uh, there's many different components within that machine. Mm -hmm. And many different components of that machine can be monitored by, by an IoT device. Mm -hmm. um, and, and many machines, you know, have multiple failure modes. And I think you would be interested in predicting, you know, the individual failure modes. If you are monitoring the entire device, I think what you might be able to see is dependencies between the failure modes occurring, okay. uh, because I mean the environment, of course, is a, is is I think a common cause. Okay, I ask this because like there is like federated learning where we have like different clients, so I'm just like thinking if I can have these clients, if the clients were different, Arduino, then like I, I don't know. Yeah, well, I think that, you but... could do. So let's say his let's say the machine in its use case has five valves. Okay. Not one, but it has five of these valves in the same machine. Each could have their own for monitoring their own performance, but then you could aggregate those together and do the overall machine performance. Okay. This is which would kind of be like federated learning and that you're doing the ML on the device yeah. and then also aggregating. Which is kind of like how iPhones work with it's learning on your device what yeah. words you type and it yeah. gives you pre written parts based on you, but then it sends all that to Apple and then Just they like, update that for yeah. everyone and send it back out to everyone yeah. else. So there's like machine learning on your phone and machine learning at Apple all integrated yeah. together. Yeah, because like for federated, like it's for privacy, like uh, we don't share like the data for the devices, only the weight of each model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just thinking if we can apply this to the same area of federated learning, just like one. It would make sense that you could, I don't see, because you just have to pull, like he would just have to get eventually the weights that are being used in his machine learning model mm -hmm. off of the Arduino and send that to someone else, mm -hmm. and then they can build a bigger model, not just of the one valve, but of all the valves that are in the machine and predict across the five valves instead of the one valve. I don't, does that make sense, Harsha, what we're talking about? Yeah, the concept yeah. of federated learning is divide the work and then aggregate uh, a global model and then redistribute the model for better performing accuracy, right? Yeah, so if you had a machine, let's say, and again, I don't know what machines, how many they would have, but if they had 10 of these valves in there, each valve is important, but the overall prediction of the valves working together might be important too. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording there.